Welcome to our virtual field hearing on Hurricane Ian and Hurricane Fiona and our effort to consider how lessons from these disasters can help us improve the resiliency and recovery of communications networks during disasters. Now, Hurricane Ian was one of the deadliest storms to hit Florida during the last century. It caused tens of billion dollars in property damage. It also struck less than two weeks after Hurricane Fiona left the entire island of Puerto Rico without power. The FCC committed significant resources to the affected areas to help ensure communications recovered quickly. Let me tell you just a little bit about that because the staff work was downright heroic. We sent teams down early to do a baseline survey of communications, which helps everyone better understand post-storm recovery. Some of those staff had a ride out Hurricane Ian at the Sarasota Police Department without voice communications or power, but they were able to stand up a Wi-Fi link to help keep sending critical information to those who needed it. Now, during both storms, we put out multilingual consumer communications tips, tailored media advisories, and made downloadable public service announcements. We activated our disaster information reporting system as part of our regular coordination with FEMA, and we published daily assessments of impacts on communications networks. We worked with communications providers to help stand up emergency running services for roaming, and that meant that affected consumers could get wireless service no matter what carrier they were using. We also stayed in daily contact with state, local, and federal officials to make sure we were doing everything we could to support their work. And then we provided regulatory relief to consumers and businesses where needed. But you know, after disasters when communications fail, I think we have to do more than just help with the immediate recovery. We really have to engage in a serious effort to identify what went wrong, what went right, and how we can do better in the future. That's why I convened a disaster communications field hearing in the wake of Hurricane Ida last year. And then we took the lessons we learned in that hearing and made improvements to our wireless resiliency cooperative framework. For the first time, we made the framework mandatory, and we expanded the times and places where carriers can roam on each other's networks. And I think that is good progress. So that's why we're coming together again today in the wake of Hurricanes Ian and Fiona. Now, a few weeks ago in mid-October, I had the opportunity to visit Florida and Puerto Rico and got a first-hand look at hurricane recovery efforts, and of course, being there in person, I learned a lot. And here's what struck me most. Coordination between communications companies and power companies can make a big difference in disaster recovery. Take Lee County, Florida. Emergency management officials told us about efforts to caravan emergency response in the hardest hit communities with a power truck followed by a communications carrier with a tower company crew after that. The goal was better coordination, you see, because when power authorities and communications companies work in concert, restoration is quicker and more effective. In fact, within 24 hours, nearly half of the cell sites in Lee County that were affected by Hurricane Ian were back up and running. And in Puerto Rico, I met with the governor, as well as officials charged with emergency response, members of the Puerto Rico Telecommunications Regulatory Board, and providers across the island. Now, I learned about some of the same logistical challenges they faced after the catastrophic flooding and the island-wide power outage. But the message I heard in every single meeting was clear. More coordination between the communications sector and the power sector could help minimize impact and speed recovery. So these experiences in Florida and Puerto Rico demonstrate that this is a common issue across disasters, and I hope it's one we're going to learn some more about today. I look forward to exploring it with the distinguished group we brought together for our two panels, and I recognize at the outset that this is an issue that is going to require us to work collaboratively across the federal government and with the private sector, as it is one that may not fall neatly under our jurisdiction. But better coordination between these critical sectors can have a big impact on communications resilience during disasters, and as far as I'm concerned, that is something worth exploring. So before I turn it over to my colleagues, I really want to thank the panelists for joining us today, both virtually and in person. And I want to thank them for all the work that they have done to get their communities through these disasters and help them bounce back. 
We are really grateful for that work. We are grateful for your participation. We've got a lot of ground to cover, so we're going to get this program rolling, and it is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to my colleagues and ask them to offer their thoughts. We will start with Commissioner Carr. Uh, thank you so much to the chair for convening uh, this field hearing. I think this is a, a really timely and important uh, opportunity to uh, take a look at some lessons learned as we're on the backside now uh, of hurricane season, but obviously there's natural disasters that go year round. I was in uh, California a year or two ago at the, during the Dixie fire and had a chance to, to walk around with some of the crews that were still putting out uh, some of the fires and learn from them about their communications challenges. So it's not just hurricanes, but hurricanes is a very big piece of this. And um, I had the chance uh, with the chair to, to go to Louisiana after the hurricane a year or so ago. And that was a trip where I learned uh, a tremendous amount. And after every single storm, I think there's lessons to be learned. Some are unique to that storm and some are issues that may never be repeated again, but you also can start to put some piece parts together uh, of some patterns throughout all of these storms. And one of them uh, that, that we've talked about and the chair has focused on is, is needing better coordination between power restoration crews and telecom crews. Uh, and I saw this uh, after Hurricane Michael uh, hit the panhandle of Florida. I was down there with some of the crews doing restoration work. And even something as simple, seemingly, as the way that, that uh, utility poles are replaced uh, after storms can make a big difference, making sure that we are working together. For instance, we heard a lot of stories there about uh, utility crews that would use corkscrew uh, trucks to dig new holes for new utility poles, which is necessary. But in the, the course of corkscrewing down, you can catch a fiber line and not just snap the fiber line, um, which is a problem but can be fixed relatively quickly, uh, but you can uh, pull the fiber line together and it just fractures it at, at many, many different points and it's very difficult to replace it. Of course, there's other types of technologies, including you know, vacuum trucks that can make holes different than corkscrew. Um, so that's sort of a narrow issue, but it's, it's, it's part of a broader story of the need to continue to coordinate. Power companies have an incredibly important job to do in the wake uh, of storms. Uh, road clearing crews have an incredibly important job to do. But if we're not sufficiently coordinated, uh, we can step on each other and we see that. And you, you see the evidence of that in the, the sawtoothing pattern of telecom restoration after storms. There's a big outage um, in the hours during uh, a storm or an incident, recovery, and then some, some steps back as lines get cut during road clearing and other utility work. So uh, I think as the chair has rightly noted, this isn't something that's necessarily uh, solely within the FCC's jurisdiction, dealing with these other industries, but we, we can continue to do a better job of coordinating. And frankly, I'm pleased with the progress that's been made. You go all the way back to uh, Superstorm uh, Sandy. I know you were at that field hearing, uh, maybe one of the first, uh, uh, when I first started as a staffer uh, at the FCC. And if you look at some of the instances, Superstorm Sandy, uh, Katrina, and other incidents, I, I think the trend line is that our networks are getting better. They are getting more resilient. Um, I was particularly pleased after this most recent hurricane in Florida with how quickly we saw restoration go. We had outages in the 20 or 30 percent of cell sites in, in certain areas down, and then within a day, you're back up to 90 percent. I thought that was, was really, really good progress. And so, again, I think there's going to be unique things for every storm, but when we start to see these patterns emerging, we can uh, step in and take action to make sure that these calls continue to, to go through when it matters most, so I look forward to this uh, field hearing and the lessons learned. So thanks again to the chair. Thank you. Uh, agree with just about everything you said there. Uh, Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, thank you to all of the panelists who are going to help us think through these very significant issues. I'm grateful that you've been able to join us um, in this hearing while you're busy, of course, with the aftermaths of Hurricanes Fiona, Ian, and, and most recently, Nicole. You know, back in 2019, I hosted a field hearing in Puerto Rico following hurricanes Irma and Maria, as well as the Puerto Rico earthquakes there. Uh, and so I lend my support um, to, to, to really learning the lessons from those disasters for future response, recovery, rebuilding efforts, uh, which truly depend so critically on access to communications. And so I can vouch that hearings like these are not just valuable and worth the effort, but an essential part of collaboration. And so thank you to the chair um, for convening us uh, here today. The FCC, of course, continues uh, to work with and support first responders and providers to make sure our networks are there when they're most needed. There is, of course, more work to do, more work to be done. And so I hope this hearing is, is part of that ongoing dialogue. There's no doubt that having a communications network go down during an emergency threatens life, threatens property. 
And while outages cannot always be avoided, we can work to reduce how often, for how long, and the scale, the impact uh, of them. Stand up alternative means of accessing the network when infrastructure is damaged uh, or potentially destroyed. And so in that context, hearing from so many dedicated uh, officials and experts on their tireless efforts uh, can help us determine what more we can do, uh, again, as was said, within our jurisdiction, but certainly um, m much of these complex issues are, are also part of better um, uh, um, uh, coordination and collaboration. We have to get this right. Lives, livelihoods depend on our success, our collective success. And so we have to move quickly. Uh, climate change as well, and the disproportionate impact that I see disasters having on very vulnerable communities is very real, uh, have truly raised the stakes of our network resiliency efforts. You know, steps, of course, um, uh, that we've taken here on the Commission Mandatory Disaster Response Initiative, improved outage information sharing are moving us, I think, uh, in the right direction. We're also exploring ways to support new technologies with clear public safety benefits, satellite systems that provide essential backup connectivity, uh, and, and even um, you know, innovative things like drones that are used to survey critical infrastructure in the wake uh, of disasters. So more than anything, uh, I'm here as a listener, of course, uh, uh, to hear what else we can do. Additional outage reporting improvements uh, could help whether the Commission should take a, a closer look at universal service um, USF fund support to make sure we're building hardened networks. Uh, but when it comes uh, to really strengthening our networks, I think no uh, good ideas should be off the table. So thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you. Now we'll hear from Commissioner Symington. <clears throat> thank you to all our panelists for being here today, and thank you to the Chairwoman for convening this, uh, these panels. I'm really encouraged at the tremendous progress that American communication networks have made in natural disaster resiliency, from the simplest but most grueling improvements like burying cables instead of running them overhead, to the most cutting edge advances like direct satellite to cell phone connectivity and mobile base stations on drones. It seems that we can look forward to a future where Americans who suffer natural disasters can count on continuous lines of communication with emergency services and their loved ones. And that's a ray of hope, because right now, post-disaster recovery is still very painful, and there's lots of work to do to get to that brighter future. I want to commend industry for their tireless innovation in this space, and I hope that F the FCC can continue to be a helpful partner, both through our regulatory and deregulatory authority, as well as our ability to, to serve as a coordination point for the myriad parties that need to work together to get this right. So I look forward to hearing from our panelists about how we can do a better job on uh, all of these roles. Thank you to my colleagues. And before we get started, I just want to say from the outset that we're in listening mode as we probe for more information on coordination and resiliency issues. And while some of what we hear today may be relevant to pending rulemakings or commission proceedings, those proceedings are gonna remain open and subject to further consideration. For today, we really look forward to hearing from the experts and this hearing's transcript will be placed in the record of relevant proceedings and open for further comments from the public. And with that, on today's first panel, we will hear firsthand accounts of public safety officials and communications industry stakeholders involved in the response to recent hurricanes. We've entitled it First Responders and Lessons Learned <coughs> from the Ground. We're gonna explore what worked, what didn't, and what lessons we can learn from their experiences. So I hope that those panelists attending virtually can all have their videos turned on at this time. And today, we're gonna to hear from Christina Darius, the Deputy Director, Chief of Staff, the Louisiana Governor's Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness. We're also gonna hear from Josh Descant, who is the Chief Executive Officer of REV. We'll hear from Paula Filla, the Manager, the Division of Government Communications Networks in Lee County Department of Public Safety, Edwin Nerarian from FirstNet External Affairs, and Enrique volkers -Nin, who is the Deputy Secretary on Innovation, Information, Data, and Technology from the Puerto Rico Governor's Office. And a few other quick reminders, this event is open to the public via a live feed from the FCC's webpage and the FCC's YouTube channel. Stakeholders and members of the public are invited to share their perspective on these topics in the form of written statements via filing with the Commission's electronic comment filing system, especially in PS docket number 21-346 and 15-80, as well as ET docket number 
2022-35. Now, written statements of the panelists and the recording of the hearing are going to be made a part of the public record, as I mentioned before. We're going to also ask our esteemed panelists to please mute themselves when not speaking or answering a commission prompted question. Also, I'm going to ask that my fellow colleagues explicitly address which witness or witnesses they'd like to hear from when they ask a question um, or otherwise specify that they are putting the question to the panel as a whole. Now, in light of the open docket as well, we emphasize that the views communicated in the course of this hearing are not intended to reflect decisions on any open issues, and we look forward to learning more as the commission develops a record in the open proceeding. So I got all my legalisms out of the way. So now we're going to proceed with opening remarks from today's panelists, followed by questions from the commission. I'd like to request the panelists limit their remarks to three minutes. We will first hear from Christina Dayries. Please proceed. Good morning. Thank you for allowing me to represent the state of Louisiana today to brief you on disaster response and restoration coordination for emergency communications. Louisiana's 2020 and 2021 hurricane season saw 11 federally declared emergencies. As a result of the multiple disaster events, our perspective in regard to emergency communications may provide critical insight as you prepare for future events. I would first like to begin by thanking Chairman Rosen Worsell for your willingness to travel to meet with Governor Edwards and our Louisiana team following Hurricane Ida and for your recent visit in September. These visits reflect the partnership and responsiveness required to address the challenges created by the historic storms which impacted our state. During the aftermath of Hurricane Ida, our dedicated public safety emergency communication system, known to us as the Louisiana Wireless Information Network, or LWIN for short, was severely impacted due to connectivity outages and loss of power. However, within one and a half weeks, the LWIN system was working at 99% of normal capacity. Based on lessons learned, our state leveraged one-time federal funding, as well as significant state funding to up upgrade the connectivity and resiliency of our tower sites to better support Elwyn and its stakeholders. After each disaster event, we develop an AARIP to summarize the strengths and challenges of the communications response. I would like to recognize and thank CISA and ICTAP for their assistance in preparing our AARIP for the Ida disaster. The Elwyn system areas of improvement identified include clicker, quicker Elwyn restoration, where we identify further coordination is required with newer and existing vendors. A need for more rapid site assessments, which will be augmented by the Louisiana National Guard Signal Unit, and an increase in our deployable communication assets. In addition to our Elwyn system, we experienced major E911 loss of connectivity, meaning the citizens of Louisiana that needed emergency services were unable to call 911. Louisiana recommends the following. We requested the FCC and AT&T implement mandatory reporting of critical public safety circuits with TSP for any area DERS is activated. Although the carrier's report to the FCC is not detailed, it does provide broad system information, which Louisiana would use as a trigger point to request a carrier's report with more specific circuit information. We requested the FCC deploy four personnel to Louisiana. The FCC project role teams look for signals and could provide notification to our ESF2 cell. We requested the FCC require the mandatory disaster response initiative, which would allow seamless communications. This went into effect on October 31st of this year, and for that we are thankful. We requested that the FirstNet president provide for more vis visibility of mobile asset locations and better coordination with the network operations group. And we requested that all agencies, including the FCC and commercial telecommunications providers operating in Louisiana, locate in our commercial carrier group to facilitate coordination during disaster events. And finally, we requested that one National Coordination Center, CISA personnel, to co coordinate emergency response efforts of wireless and wireline carriers. Overall, the more, ma the more concerned matter we want to ensure we bring to your attention is centered on the telephone circuits, where FCC is the regulating body for these carriers, as well as the need to raise awareness and funding for emergency communications at the state and local levels. The areas of improvement and related requests we identified today will provide for a more efficient and rapid response to any disaster event states may face in the future. I would like to thank you for your time and attention today, and this concludes my statement. Thank you very much. And now we will hear from Joshua Descant.
Well, good morning, Chair, Chairwoman Rosenworcel and commissioners. Thank you for this opportunity to participate in today's field hearing. Uh, as you said, my name is Josh Deskin. I'm the CEO of, of REV and a member of the President's National Infrastructure Advisory Council, also known as NIAC. Uh, my views today are through a personal professional lens and, and on behalf of, of REV. Uh, REV is a mid-sized communications and, and broadband provider headquartered in Southeast Louisiana with 87 years of experience in our region. We were an early fiber entrant uh, around 2005, 2006. We built out 100% fiber to the home and business network in our more northern region of Ascension Parish. Uh, we're very proud to be a trusted communications provider for uh, lots of local stakeholders, local governments, sheriff's departments, wireless providers. And, and because of our geography here, we have lots of uh, partnerships in the energy sector because of oil and gas, uh, ultimately that are vital to, to national uh, national security. Uh, because of this long history in the, in the Gulf region, you know it's unfortunate that we do have a lot of experience with weathering hurricanes and and floods. Uh, and, and hurricanes and floods and telecommunications infrastructure don't get along very well, as you know. Uh, over the years, we've learned to adapt our networks. I do agree with Commissioner Carr that we've come a long way, and I'm very encouraged, uh, not only for ourselves and our region, but ultimately in the industry, how much we've learned and improved our networks. What I'm more proud of is, uh, and always like to talk about, is our employees. You know, they are battle-tested. They have always risen to the occasion. They are very passionate and determined to keep our communities connected, and in many cases, uh, they've done so while their own homes are uninhabitable from these events. So our broad perspective, you know, from these experience really is, is two very simple but crucial factors and are discussed a lot at this level uh, as it relates to efficient response and recovery. And that is communication and coordination is just so critical. Uh, what I encourage uh, everyone to really think about and continue is to have a very equitable field of view to include not only large stakeholders in those communications and coordination, but also small and medium sized stakeholders and not just in our sector but at the community at large it has to be an all of community all of industry approach depending on the event and the circumstances to make sure everybody's at the table to, to communicate and coordinate so a few few quick lessons that i think are familiar here the first is community coordination with our electric utility partners as, as commissioner carr pointed out before during and after disasters there are secondary network outages because of inadvertent uh, cuts both aerial and underground, uh, and, and that also puts emergency communications at risk oftentimes in those secondary cuts. So I do recognize the progress there and encouraged by what I've seen from the cross-sector resiliency forum as well as the CCG, the commercial coordination group headed by FEMA, along with CISA, Department of Energy, and local stakeholders that we were able to participate with in daily calls in Hurricane Ida to really be plugged in to what was happening on the ground. Secondarily, intrasector cooperation is very important. We have a lot of experience with that, and, we, and we've uh, forged very good relationships with our other wire, wireline and wireless provider partners in the area. For example, in 2016, we had a 500-year flood where we were able to help a major wireless carrier switch uh, traffic from a MITSO that had gone underwater in that 500-year flood to New Orleans to keep cell towers running. And, and ultimately uh, probably saved lives as people were, were literally walking around in waste deep water in their communities. Uh, and then third, ongoing communication with our government partners like uh, discussions like this and uh, at the federal, state and, and local levels is key. And, 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 and lastly, uh, another key lesson is look, expect and prepare for supply chain disruptions. That's something we've experienced. Uh, we take a belt and suspenders approach to how we think about our fuel contractors, our generator contractors, you know, elevating infrastructure, anticipating worse, worse disasters in the future. So, uh, and, and then, you know, I'd also add that, uh, you know, that we should shift our strategy toward a more proactive approach than reactive. Uh, it's clear that sunny day investments will be increasingly important, but obviously there are significant costs to that. I, I do think we have an opportunity with the public-private uh, partnership momentum that we have in this industry to continue to stretch that and, and take advantage of, of the, you know, the, the spirit of how we're coming together to solve for that moving forward. So in closing, thank you again for the chance to be a part of this important conversation, and, and I look forward to some more dialogue here. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Duskin. And now we have uh, Paul Phila from the Lee County Department of Public Safety. And I just want to say that I had the pleasure of meeting with him and his colleagues in Lee County, Florida, not that long ago. And I was so impressed by the work they're doing. I'm thrilled you're willing to be here and uh, tell a broader community uh, just you. what you do for disaster and storm recovery. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. It was a month ago and commissioners for having me here to share our experience, our perspective on the communications impacts during Hurricane Ian. One role I, I carry in Lee County is I manage an 18 site P25 radio system. Three of those sites lie on Sanibel and Pine Islands, which no longer had roads to access. On a normal day, the system peaks at 25% utilization for the 22 talk paths with zero busies. On September 29th and 30th, there were several thousand busies. Many factors played into this atypical users and uses failure to manage distinct talk groups, and ultimately my lack of planning to monitor performance and mitigate busies. While not optimally for the reasons I mentioned, the radio system continued to operate. Some sites, not in white area, some required finessing by the local Motorola shop and the Motorola emergency response team, but first responders maintained radio communication. Another responsibility I hold is managing a geodiverse 911 system. You have heard or may have heard through the media or social media that Lee County 911 experienced an outage. I can say unequivocally that the Lee County 911 system did not go down and zero calls were routed to other counties. In fact, 10 additional trunks were turned up to offer more inbound 911 capacity and the cache of deployed command post laptops provided more call taker positions. The Lee County Sheriff's Office and Sanibel Police Departments relocated days before the storm as designed to perform their work inside our bunker. In the days leading up to the storm, the county's PSAPs averaged 3,400 daily calls. From September 28th to October 1st, the PSAPs averaged 12,000 daily calls, a three to four fold increase. Our county public safety network manager for 911, J.C. Meyer, and his team executed a well-designed plan the system he architected ensured performance, redundancy, and scalability in so many ways. Did we answer every 911 call? Only the local exchange carrier has that information, but know that all calls that entered the 911 system were routed internally and answered by Lee County 911 call takers. My introduction did not mention the other duties as assigned that Ian presented. One of those duties was coordinating the communication needs of strike teams supporting the rescue and response efforts in Lee County. The state ESF-2 dispatch resources and a team to Lee County led locally by Sergeant Jason Matthews from Lake County Sheriff's Office. This team's experience in previous storm response and their coordination with the state ESF-2 arm and our local vendor for radio support services allowed us to leverage the LMR infrastructure, both the conventional and simulcast, to support these inbound teams. My dependence on ESF-2 during these days and weeks was invaluable. The second duty I believe is the focus of this panel is the coordination of the restoration efforts of the cellular services. First responders like our citizens have an appetite for cellular services. Like my radio towers, the carrier systems took hits from Ian. Lee County first response agencies primarily operate on Verizon's priority and preemption services, and the responders coming into Lee County when not on Verizon were often operating on FirstNet. I was able to establish con contacts with these carriers with greater Oh, early in the process to get regular updates on their restoration efforts, some with greater transparency, regularity, and presence at our EOC than others. But ultimately, my goal was to make sure they had whatever they needed from Lee County to operate um, and pointed them in the right direction if they needed something. The carriers, the power companies, the local broadband suppliers providing backhaul, county administration, local municipalities, and the Lee County Sheriff's Office as well as the respective representatives at the state were all these resources that I was able to point to during the storm. So thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Phila. Next, we will hit, hear from Ed Narian from uh, FirstNet. And thank you, Madam Chairwoman and commissioners for the invitation to join you here today to discuss AT&T FirstNet's efforts to prepare for and respond to Hurricane Ian. Uh, using information from the AT&T Weather Operations Center in the days leading up to Hurricane Ian, AT&T and FirstNet's teams prepared for Hurricane Ian by pre-positioning disaster response equipment, placing personnel on standby in strategic areas, and closely collaborating with federal, state, and local public safety stakeholders to expedite response time 
in support of potentially impacted communities. The close coordination with public safety meant that we were the first to access and provide connectivity to the hardest hit areas, most notably in Charlotte, Collier and Lee counties. Our external affairs team and the FirstNet Response Operations Group, also known as ROB, worked very closely with FEMA and both the state and county level emergency operations centers to ensure that resources were quickly placed where they were needed the most. This collaboration with federal, state, and local first responders, utility providers, and with government officials allowed us to get portable network access to Sanibel and Pine Islands via amphibious vehicles, air support, and compact rapid deployables. Because power companies play a vital role in restoration, it's important that communication providers and power stay in very close alignment to minimize network disruptions that can occur during the restoration process. Our external affairs team consistently cultivates relationships with our peers in the power industry, and we utilize those relationships during natural disasters. During the response to Ian, a great example of that collaboration was found in Florida Power and Light liaisons working hand in hand with AT&T FirstNet to evaluate the hardest hit areas and to communicate priority restoration targets such as government buildings and AT&T stores that were being used as recovery centers for the local community in both Lee, Port Charlotte and Bradenton. At these locations, customers could receive free charging devices, they could contact loved ones, get water and secure the help that they needed. Also, in following the CTIA Voluntary Cooperative Wireless Resiliency Framework, AT&T enabled roaming on our network for our competitors in a very timely fashion. In fact, through October 12th, we saw more than 50 terabytes of traffic from customers on those carriers, which is the equivalent of 17 and a half billion text messages. All in all, as Hurricane Ian made its way from Florida to Virginia, the FirstNet team at AT&T responded to more than 115 emergency FirstNet requests from public agencies and direct support organizations that use FirstNet for their response and recovery operation efforts. Because of Ian, over 85 critical communication solutions were deployed. That includes over 40 sat -cults, which are satellite cells on light trucks, and about 20 uh, CRDs, which are basically portable cell sites, as well as emergency communication, mobile broadband kits, and indoor wireless repeaters. However, this quick recovery wouldn't have been possible without extensive pre-planning under the blue sky conditions and solid coordination between the government, AT&T FirstNet, and our utility partners throughout the state. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. And last but not least on our final, uh, final witness from our first panel, and we will hear from Enrique Volkersnid. Thank you. Good morning, Chairwoman Rosenworcel, commissioners and distinguished panel guests and members. My name is Enrique Volkers, Deputy Chief of Staff on Innovation, Information, Data and Technology of the Government of Puerto Rico. I am honored to be part of today's hearing. I submitted a written statement with more details in order to respect the time of this hearing. Even, even since um, Hurricane Maria in September 2017, the government of Puerto Rico has recognized the importance of telecommunications and, elect, and enacted law number no. 5, 2018, recognizing telecommunications as an essential service to the public. We have established a close working with relationship with FEMA, DHS, CISA, and the FCC. I'm confident that we have matured together with every incident and the knowledge of Puerto Rico peculiarities increases. Our most significant handicap is a very outdated and fragile power system. So delicate that's a, a precaution, the power plants are turned off to reduce, reduce the impact of them during major atmospheric threats. I don't think there's only any other jurisdiction or state that does that to prevent um, impact. Anybody, everybody in Puerto Rico has learned to prepare to be without commercial power and water for days and based on the event, events impact even months. 
the telecom carriers have made significant efforts and investment to remain operational without commercial power, installing generators and batteries in most cell sites and critical infrastructure. After Hurricane Fiona hit Puerto Rico, we confronted confronted a fuel availability problem as distributors diesel's inventory start running low and opted to ratio to ration the amount provided. While working this situation, we learned that the leading carriers have a daily need of roughly 80, 70 to 80 thousand gallons of fuel to maintain critical operations running. Throughout the work that has done been doing during the emergency, we can assure we have identified different uh, matters to improve uh, specifically on sharing information and the recovery progress efforts. The FCC DERS was activated for Fiona, but at our local level, there was some unwillingness to share this type of information with local governments, which we understand being sensitive and, and a confidential matter. But without that needed information, it is very difficult to plan ahead on fuel and emergency deployments during times of need. We bring to the FCC's attention that most of the cell sites are in the metropolitan area. From a percentage perspective, the specific reality of most of the affected areas that were the south and west of the island were not necessarily clearly represented in the total uh, percentage of coverage. We need to dive into the lo locations in detail to see the specific affected areas and correlate them with population density. Puerto Rico counts with a high level technologically referenced to geo reference tool so that we have live data sets that represent the reality of our critical infrastructure and helps the government and emergency and rescue efforts make intelligent decisions based, based on data. In, retros in retrospect, we can say that the impact of Hurricane Fiona in Puerto Rico on the telecommunications industry is proof that the significant improvements have been made since 2017. We are more than grateful of all the relief efforts made by the FCC and the enactment of the Uniendo, for Puerto, Uniendo Puerto Rico Fund so that we could recover from the disasters and build more resilient connectivity for our constituents. Nevertheless, with the bipartisan infrastructure bill, it is imperative that we discuss ways to be more flexible in the use of all those federal funds assigned to Puerto Rico to maximize the benefit of all 3.2 million American citizens that live in Puerto Rico. Finally, Governor Pedro Pierluisi and I will thank the M want to thank the FCC members who during and after Hurricane Fiona flew to Puerto Rico to assist in the recovering efforts. Chairman, Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel, thank you for your visit. Roman, Roberto Mosender, Tim Perrier, Juan Silva, Justin Kane, and Carmen Scurato. We can say that the island has always counted on support from the SCC. So again, we are most grateful. Thank you for your time today, and this concludes my, my message. Thank you so much, and I appreciate everyone's efforts to keep this short. I know you all have lots of stories to tell and lots of information to share. So now we're going to proceed to some brief questioning of our witnesses here, and I will offer Commissioner Carr the opportunity to start. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks to all the witnesses for uh, your testimony. Uh, this has been very helpful and informative. Uh, one question I have for uh, for AT&T FirstNet. One of the lessons that we learned uh, is about roaming during disasters and how, um, at least in that particular context, it can go a long way to improving and maintaining connectivity. And, and recently we built on the 2015, 2016 voluntary framework that the FCC put in place and turned it into a mandatory framework. Now, interestingly, I think that went into effect around October 31st, right, sort of when a lot of these storms were hitting. So we didn't get to have that fully stood up over a period of time before this round of hurricanes, but I'm hopeful that's going to uh, uh, play a role. Is there anything that you can speak to uh, in terms of your early experience with that or other thoughts on facilitating uh, roaming during disasters? Um, I would say that I believe it's a, a very positive thing for the region. At the end of the day, uh, Verizon, T-Mobile, and other uh, cell providers don't become our competitors when we're in the middle of an emergency situation. So we're going to do whatever we have to do to ensure that the recovery 
efforts happen as quickly as they happen can happen for all the residents of that impacted area. So for us, the, the storm hit uh, as a Category 4 on the 28th, and by September 29th, we had opened up our network for roaming. So it was really just a matter of us taking an initial assessment of our network, making sure that we were functional and that we could handle the support. And we, in a very timely fashion, opened up our network to our peers to allow uh, the customers that they serve to also be able to communicate seamlessly with their loved ones that were concerned about them. So at this stand, at this point, we believe it's a good thing. We believe it's a positive thing. And you know, hopefully we don't have to enact this again anywhere else in the country, but the, the stark reality is as natural disasters hit, communication is the most important thing. Thanks. Uh, and let me shift over to, to Josh with REV. Uh, good to see you. I know that the chairwoman and I had a good visit with uh, your company down in Louisiana recently. One of the things that you've talked about is, is the, the need for providers to have real-time information, uh, all providers, not just large providers, uh, as to the status of, of networks. We've been seeing instances before where um, a, a vendor for a big carrier, one that provides line services, has more insight uh, than the carrier itself and sometimes vice versa. Now, obviously, in these scenarios, we have operations centers, there's command centers. What more from your perspective needs to be done from a, a real-time information sharing and, and, and some of your ideas on how we get there? Sure, and, and Commissioner Carr, you know, again, th thank you for, for your visit and Chairwoman Rosenworcel as well. That, that really meant a lot to our team and I think gave us, you know, both the opportunity uh, to, to share openly, you know, how, how we saw things on the ground. And, and, and that was, uh, as I recall, literally just a, maybe a few weeks after the event. So you had an opportunity to see sort of the, the real and fresh impact that that had on the community. Uh, you know, as far as as far as the communication, as I as I mentioned earlier, you know, I we have to think about small and medium sized stakeholders because those types of providers, like ourselves, don't always have the the muscle or the staff from a government affairs standpoint, public relations standpoint, to really know how to you know navigate and plug in with uh, particularly government resources to make sure that we have direct lines of communication, right? So. What, what we found in the past is that we're very much trying to elbow ourselves into conversations or meetings that we didn't even maybe know were happening at, at a much higher level. And in some cases, all the way up to, to Washington, I, I have seen improvement in that regard, particularly with Hurricane Ida. As I mentioned with the commercial coordination group, uh, we were able to participate in, in those conversations. And I, and I fear what would have happened if we did not. Uh, I, I think that there's uh, an opportunity, if you will, to get those lines of communication open and established in a Rolodex form, if you will, before events, and to understand within geographies and communities who are the stakeholders, small, medium, and large, that should be participating should an event happen. And certainly at the onset of the event, we need to identify that as well. So from our, from our perspective, that's an area that's, that's improved a lot. But uh, you know, the type of information that we need, and I spoke to it earlier in particular is, coordinating with the power utilities uh, in those conversations to know where do they plan to go next. Their, their resources, you know, order of magnitude are way greater than ours. Uh, in, in Hurricane Ida, probably tens of thousands of bucket trucks flowing into our region doing their job. And it's very difficult, again, for a small, medium-sized provider, if not communicating with that power provider, where they plan to go next, to be there on site and to explain where we have active infrastructure or underground utilities and so forth. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Starks. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I want to point this question to you, Mr. Uh, Enrique volkers -Nin. Um, as I mentioned, I visited Puerto Rico uh, after the hurricanes, after the earthquakes, uh, and, and appreciated your comments. I, I uh, very much heard a number of concerns coming from, from PREPA. Um, uh, that, that has a lot of energy work um, uh, down there in Puerto Rico and some of those issues, so I appreciate you uh, focusing on that. You know, I notice um, uh, in your title, you very much, uh, or Deputy Secretary to Innovation, Information, Data, and Technology, you were great talking to us about some of the information and data uh, issues that you have. Can, can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of innovation and technology that is helping 
uh, folks down there in Puerto Rico, as I mentioned in, in, in my opening, you know, satellites, uh, drones, are, 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 are there any things just more holistically that I'd, I, I'd like to hear from you on that you're seeing down there in Puerto Rico? Well, right now, based on the infrastructure bill and all of the different um, federal um, funds that are going to come to Puerto Rico, there's going to be a really massive push to get everybody connected in the island and use those funds to really innovate, to get communications to the very difficult places in Puerto Rico. As you know, you've come to here to Puerto Rico, our topography is really different from different states. So there are a lot of areas in Puerto Rico that are very, very difficult to get a, a underground cable to. So we are experimenting and working with different innovative um, connectivity uh, programs and connectivity technology that could get a, a very, very high uh, capacity um, internet and communications to those specific areas. There are a lot of programs and different entities that, are reach, that we are reaching out to right now to make sure that we get all of the knowledge of the different works that are being done here in Puerto Rico. As I said, uh, as you said, I'm I'm this uh, uh, you know deputy secretary on innovation, and it's a very very important part of our government to really focus on new and alternative way, ways to get communications to the island, specifically for those places that do not even have a specific, you know, a good cell phone um, signal. So we are working and we're working hand in hand also with the different carriers to make sure that we work in in unison to connect to all of the all of the citizens. One more quick question. I know we're, uh, we have a second panel as well. Uh, this question to you, uh, Miss Christina Darius. Um, you know, one of the things that, uh, in particular, um, uh, there was a, a white paper uh, by EPA um, published very recently that talks about how there's a disproportionate impact by natural disasters, uh, weather-related events on low-income and very vulnerable communities. Can you tell me, um, you know, how you've seen this uh, there in Louisiana, how you've seen the response? Uh, in particular on some of these very vulnerable communities? And do you see any, are there any kind of acute issues that you all think about in advance as you're approaching um, um, folks this way? I know um, the state of Louisiana with our governor, uh, John Bell Edwards, he um, just recently implemented his Louisiana Climate Action Plan. So he's kind of one of the few Southern states that have put that plan in place um, in our area. And so we are building on that with the recent IIJA funding to try to implement some of those initiatives in, in our plan. And in regards to our public safety communications, we are taking um, a very aggressive investment in hardening and being more resilient in our public safety communications that's statewide. In addition to trying to work with our um, 911 agencies and our telecom uh, wireless and wireline companies to just really target those vulnerable um, areas, which include for our Louisiana, we're so rural, um, we're very, um, uh, you know, lower educated community, I guess, across the nation. So for us, um, the target, target on the Gulf Coast for us is our vulnerable population, is the critical area that we are spending a lot of investment in state dollars and then any of the federal funds that come towards us, um, we are putting into that climate action plan that the governor has and targeting that coastal community. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, before we get into sophisticated questions of policy and planning, I just want to ask a basic question. Um, uh, so, uh, and I'd be particularly interested in Mr. Descant's or uh, Ms. Darius' perspective on this. Are there any FCC regulations or policies that, in your view, just uh, obviously stand in the way of quickly restoring service in the aftermath of a natural disaster? In other words, can you help us identify potential low-hanging fruit uh, for easy focus and quick resolution? Uh, thank you for the question, Commissioner Symington. Uh, there, there's none that I can can think of uh, offhand, but we're happy to to give that some thought and, and circle back, uh, you know, with the commission on that front.
please unmute yourself, Ms. Darius. Sorry about that. Um, uh, Chair Chairman Rosen Warshall uh, mentioned this in her opening comments, that uh, coordination and collaboration on Blue Sky Days, we have seen significant um, progress when all of our stakeholders come together, the private sector with our new commercial carrier group um, co-located next to our state EOC during disasters is critical, but we don't wanna do that after the disaster. A whole lot of knowing um, what's their commercial carriers plans um, pre-event will help us um, either augment them or them augment the state's plan. And so a lot of that coordination collaboration um, during Blue Sky Days will go far. As far as rules, um, I think working through that, through the disaster planning, will maybe identify something, but off the top of our head, um, I think what you recently did on October 31st is going to do a significant improvement for our state. Um, thank you very much, and I, I really appreciate those comments, um, uh, particularly because we want to make sure that, um, that uh, as Mr. Descant noted, uh, that smaller providers are not always uh, best positioned to engage with the federal government and um, may run into a red tape that would uh, be a greater, uh, be less of an impediment to a larger organization. Um, I'd like to address my next question to Mr. Volker Janin. Um, can you speak to, please to the legal process for installing new infrastructure like power generators, redundant backhaul, new towers and so forth in Puerto Rico? Is, and in particular, is there, some, is there any red tape we could directly address that would be an obstacle to speedy de deployment or is this more something that would be a joint effort uh, between us and some other entities? Yes, I'm um, great. It's de definitely, that could be a really um, a, a joint effort, particularly because that um, regulatory process of building new cell sites and constructing constructing tower depends on a lot of uh, uh, a lot of time on that municipality where the tower is going to get constructed. But when Governor Pierluisi entered um, in 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 the administration, he enacted an executive order um, identifying a different reconstruction uh, important task to be expedited um, in the permitting process. And telecommunications and broadband are part of those priority projects. So we do have um, a, a process that it's been um, analyzed and implementing to expedite those type of process focused on reconstruction and resilience in that telecommunications and broadband infrastructure that's needed to be, you know, um, and spread throughout um, the island. So it's it's something that is it is you as you said there's really a lot of red tape based on on all of the processes right now there is a process ongoing that the um all the regulatory um documents um regarding um the the permits it's being rethought and rewritten in order to expedite the, that expedite uh, that process uh, thank you very much sir that's very instructive and uh, of course we've uh, spent some time considering the question of federal preemption and on municipal issues and, you know, trying to address that in uh, various ways. I very much appreciate your comments. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, I think that's all I have. Uh, thank you to my colleagues. So uh, first, I'm going to make a plug and then I'm going to ask a question. Our disaster information reporting system, known as DERS, came up. That is where, on a voluntary basis, we collect data from our carriers and we set it up in advance of known weather events, the kind that affect Florida, Louisiana, and Puerto Rico with some regularity. And we, uh, this year, for the first time in a very long time, decided that we should make that data available to our state and local counterparts because at least I'm fairly convinced that you'll see patterns in that data that we won't and you can put it to good use. You just have to sign up for its use so that we maintain appropriate confidentiality. So I just want to encourage those who are out here to do that. I, I see Enrique nodding his head because I believe they actually have in Puerto Rico already. But I certainly want to encourage others to do so, um, not just because we want to share that data with you, but we want you to take a look at it and help us learn from it as well. Now, I do have a question, though. And again, this is going to go to our colleagues from Florida, uh, Louisiana, and Puerto Rico. And we'll start with you, Mr. Fila. Tell me what's the best thing that you do in Lee County to coordinate with power authorities and how you think that we might be able to make that a best practice nationally. 
I think, presence, being in the EOC, um, whether it's the state EOC or the local EOC, and just making sure the players have a face FaceTime because you don't see it if they're not there. And I, and I think the one thing I would uh, extend to that is, and Commissioner Carr mentioned it, I don't think it's just the power, though. I think it's the broadband carriers. Mm -hmm. Um, that sawtooth effect is going to happen, but if you have a broadband carrier following this caravan of, of power companies, then they can repair it there. Um, and, I, and I mentioned it to some of the staff here. Um, the Motorola Emergency Response Team came out, and um, they handled the, the LMR part of our restoration, and they were like the Swiss Army knife. They had people who can fix all of those things. Like if it's a generator power, they had those guys. They had people who can climb the tower. They had people who could fix a generator. They had people who can fix br the, the, the fiber cuts. So it didn't matter. And I, like they came as Motorola, so that's one credential. So it's, it gets more complicated when you have a broadband carrier who's not associated with the tower company, who's not associated with the generator repair company. So those credentials get a little difficult and hairy because each of these municipalities and each of these mm -hmm. law enforcement agencies credentialing to get onto these barrier islands was very difficult. Mm -hmm. So I think coordination at the EOC, making sure that, and, and transparency of what's going on. So then we can say, hey, tomorrow we're going to be on the south side of the island. So any resources going that way, let them go. And they're associated with this fix. I think that's the key is that, that transparency and that coordination. But you guys know that like you're it's what this is about is just but I wouldn't I wouldn't narrow the scope to just power I would say anything that's going to restore those communications that would be key okay that's helpful uh, Miss Darius can you respond uh, from a Louisiana perspective well, Mr. Filler hit it on the nose. He, he truly nailed it. Um, and we've uh, learned in Louisiana, our, our uh, Public Service Commission is co-located in RSC, and they brief the governor every day, um, sometimes several times a day, on the situation that's happening during the disaster. Um, but what we would like to see is some good task force, that pre-planning and developing task force that Mr. Filler mentioned, um, where you're going along with the power companies, um, the broadband companies, the telecom communication companies, on little task forces and really targeting those disaster areas to be able to click, quickly get access to. That's the biggest issue. Sometimes you can't even get to an area that has been damaged that you need to repair. So really doing a lot of that pre-planning, but co-locating in the EOC, that coordination is, is critical for us. Well, thank you. Mr. Volkers, Nin, and especially I want to hear from you because I know you've had some unique challenges with Puerto Rico and power. Yes, there, there, there has been. Um, I, I want to agree with um, Deputy Davies and uh, Mr. Fila about um, what they said. It's it's really important that communication and obviously that pre-planning. Those those two items are very very important. As you know, in Puerto Rico, we have a private a public private uh, partnership that deals with um, distribution um, of um, uh, of the power in Puerto Rico. So our main um, roadblock was um, communication and data accessibility with power authority. It's it's very important. I'm, I, I come from a programming and data background. So for us, it's very important to have a specific um, data information so we can plan going forward. As I mentioned in my statement, in Puerto Rico, we have a, a geographical map asset, asset system that we can plan ahead what are going to be our um, response efforts. Obviously, every every emergency, every state, it's unique, their, their response, and we cannot plan 100% ahead. But the more information that we have can help on planning the different scenarios that we that we can implement. One thing in Puerto Rico that happened, there was a lot, a lot of fiber that was cut. Mm -hmm. And even, um, even the power of the, the uh, Luma um, personnel because they did not have the specific data and information of where some specific lines were cut. They cut um, 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 fiber lines um, when they were fixing poles and where, when they, will, they were drilling. So I, I, I need to come back to that information and data accessibility within Luma, the power, you know, authority, the power of the P3 authority, and within the telecommunications um, 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 companies, carriers, because um, I know, and, and as, as I said, is a, it's a very confidential uh, matter that we need to handle, but it is imperative 
that we can have that specific communication to know where things are so we can plan ahead and plan in, the, in, in terms of emergency. Fortunately, after Fiona, um, obviously there has been a lot of work with um, Luma and a lot of communications going on, and we are still working to have those assets connected to our system so we can effectively uh, plan and, and, and work with with those emergencies. So if I needed to sum up, it's it's information and data. It's crucial for us to plan a very, very good ref, uh, uh, effort on response. All right, I just wanna thank you all for sharing your experiences with us. You are rounding out our knowledge as we are exiting this hurricane season. And with that, we are concluding panel one, lessons on the ground. And we are going to shortly now move on to panel two. So let's make sure we can have a technical swap out and change. Thank you all for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Five of us here? I think we do. All right. Nathan? All right, we are back. And again, welcome to today's field hearing focused on the impact of hurricanes Fiona and Ian to communications in Puerto Rico, Florida, learning what worked, what didn't, and how we are going to improve disaster response in the future. So the witnesses for today's second panel, I hope you all have turned on your cameras. It does look like that is happening, thank you. Our second panel is entitled Disaster Life Experiences, and it is designed to examine opportunities to improve wireless resiliency through better coordination with the power sector, as well as just discuss innovative ideas for mitigating disaster impacts on communications. And I'm really honored that we are joined by a diverse group of experts. And today we're gonna to hear from Scott Aronson, who is the Senior Vice President of Security and Preparedness at the Edison Electric Institute. 
from Najee Curry, the Chief Executive Officer of Liberty Mobile, from Arturo Masoldea, the uh, Executive Director of Casa Pueblo, and Angela Maria Nardolilio, I'm sorry if I got that wrong, um, you'll correct me, Creative Director, Founder of Off the Grid Missions, and Matthew Tuck, the Senior Manager for Verizon Wireless Network Operations. All right. And I'm just going to recap a few housekeeping items and reminders for anyone who's just turning in. This event is open to the public, and it is being broadcast via a live feed from the FCC's webpage as well as the agency's YouTube channel. Stakeholders and members of the public are invited to share their perspectives on these topics in the form of written statements via filing in the Commission's electronic comment filing system. And by that, I mean specifically PS docket number 21-346 and 15-80, as well as ET docket number 04-35. Now, written statements of the panelists and uh, recording or transcript of the hearing is going to be made part of the public record in these dockets, but I'm going to also ask our esteemed panelists to please mute themselves when they're not speaking or answering a commission-directed question, and I'm also going to ask my colleagues to explicitly address which witness or which witnesses they'd like to hear from when we get to the questioning portion of today's hearing and our second panel. Now, in light of the open docket as well, I just want to emphasize that the views communicated in the course of this hearing are not intended to reflect decisions on open issues, and we look forward to learning more. The Commission just really wants to develop a more robust Issue, record on these issues, and thanks everyone here today for their participation. So now we're going to proceed with opening remarks from today's second panel, followed by questions from my colleagues and myself, and I'd like to request that our panelists speak for roughly three minutes. We're going to start with Scott Aronson. Well, good afternoon. I'm not sure if you guys can see me. <laughs> I think we're having some technical difficulties, so okay. Well, we hear just, you uh, loud and clear. I did put a, I, I did put a suit and tie on for this, but I guess it was for nothing. Uh, we'll do this. Uh, we'll do this audio. I've got a a face for radio anyway. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Scott Aronson. I'm the senior vice president of security and preparedness for the Edison Electric Institute. Uh, EEI is the trade association that represents all of the nation's investor-owned electric companies. Uh, in addition to my role at EEI, I also serve as the part of the Secretariat for the Electricity Subsector Coordinating Council, which brings all segments of the electric power sector together with senior government officials to prepare for and respond to all hazards facing the energy grid. Given these roles and perspectives, the, uh, the perspectives they inform, I appreciate the FCC holding this hearing to examine coordination across the electricity and telecommunications sectors and to highlight lessons from this year's hurricane season and other events in recent years. Maybe before I say anything else, I, I think the commission and first panel hit a lot of the key points about the value of coordination and relationships and partnerships really effectively. Uh, so I want to associate myself with many of those comments. Uh, given the profound interdependencies that the electric power and telecommunication sectors have, uh, we've found common cause to work in a collaborative way through a number of venues, uh, including uh, what has been mentioned, the Cross-Sector Resiliency Forum, which was initiated following Hurricane Michael in 2018, and a tri-sector executive working group that also includes the financial sector, working to ensure that these lifeline sectors are coordinated before, during, and after events uh, that impact our respective operations. As critical infrastructure operators, ensuring a reliable supply of energy is a top priority for EEI and its members. The mantra of better today than we were yesterday and better tomorrow than we are today informs much of our work as we prepare to re respond to all hazards that threaten our operations. Since Superstorm Sandy, EEI members have invested more than $340 billion to enhance the electric grid to address threats. Uh, in addition to these resilience investments and critical partnerships with government and other interdependent sectors, the industry also conducts exercises at the local, regional, and national levels. Increasingly, the telecommunications sector is an integral part of these exercises, including EEI's national response event exercises, uh, the Department of Energy's Clear Path series, and the extraordinary GridX series of exercises conducted by the North American Electric Reliability Corporation every two years. We deeply appreciate that leaders from the telecommunications sector, including private sector representatives, FCC staff, and DHS as the Sector Risk Management Agency, all participate in these important activities. Exercises offer an invaluable opportunity for industry and government officials at all levels to evaluate plans, identify risks, address gaps, and develop actionable mitigation strategies to enhance the resilience and security of the nation's most critical infrastructure. 
Additionally, after action reports and hot washes help both sectors to learn from every experience and refine response capabilities. I want to thank the Commission for their leadership in this space. As I mentioned earlier, following Hurricane Michael, the FCC recommended closer coordination between the electric power sector and telecommunications providers. Since then, EEI and key communications sector trade associations have worked together and with our members in the Cross-Sector Resiliency Forum. As each commissioner mentioned in your opening comments, this forum has resulted in tangible improvements that support the timely and safe restoration of critical services. We also share the Commission's desire to improve practices that prevent fiber cuts after storms. In addition to electric sector and communications providers, additional stakeholders, including state departments of transportation and others responsible for road clearing and debris removal are integral to ensuring critical communications infrastructure is prioritized as crews work to restore power. Just as electricity is critical to life and safety of customers and communities, we recognize communication com capabilities are as well. Not to mention that communications also supports electric power sector restoration activities. So there's strong alignment of interests between the sectors and with the commission. Thank you again for the opportunity to present to you today. I look forward to the conversation uh, and to continue enhancing coordination between these sectors and with our government partners at all levels. Thank you, Mr. Aronson. Now we turn the mic to Najee Curry. The floor is yours for opening remarks. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Commissioner. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I am the Chief Executive Officer for Liberty Mobile Puerto, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, as well as Liberty Communication Puerto Rico. I appreciate very much the opportunity to speak today regarding our experience after Hurricane Fiona, focusing on the interaction with and the impact of the power sector on communication. In contrast to Hurricane Maria, which has devastating wind and water impact, Hurricane Fiona was a Category 1 and the damage largely resulted from the unprecedented rainfall associated with it. Our network did not experience significant damage from Hurricane Fiona, wind or rain. Nevertheless, we incurred millions of dollars in increased costs largely attributable to widespread and prolonged power outages, which prevented customers from using our services. Our mobile network demonstrated its resilience from investment in underground fiber and standby generator in over 90% of our cell site. Mobile coverage remained close to 100% and utilization increased by more than 20%. Even with this increased usage, we were able to open our mobile network to other carriers and other carrier customer to roam. Our fixed broadband network also experienced few equipment outages and continued to perform well, except for the lack of power, where it is close to impossible to install generator. Our fiber to the home network and resilient node, those connected to private Liberty generators or customer generator, continue providing the service. However, the rest of our HFC plant lost power a few hours after the general power blackout, and in most cases up to 10 hours with the battery backup. During our third quarter, we incurred roughly $12 million in increased cost, with an additional 8 million estimated cost before the year end resulting from Hurricane Fiona. Well over half the additional cost resulted from credit to our customer, principally to cable and broadband customers who were without services due to lack of power. In addition to customer credit, we expanded, <coughs> excuse me, we expanded approximately two and a half million of fuel to run our generator during the power outage. At over $6 a gallon for fuel, this should not be surprising, but in my view, it is a huge number. We use roughly 35,000 gallons of diesel fuel daily immediately after the hurricane and heavy rains, with roughly 35 crews refueling over 700 generators. Additional costs also resulted from equipment damages by voltage spikes when power was being restored. Over time, and cost for increased security to protect facilities and portable generator we placed on exterior equipment well exceeded a million dollars. The performance of fixed and mobile communication provider is inextricably tied to the performance of the power sector. By in our experience, which is different from the continental United States, we're greatly affected by inflation, fuel and material shortage, and other circumstances that impact us differently because we are an island. Even if we can maintain a normal operation, our customer may be unable to communicate or receive service because they are without power to operate their in-home devices. The power grid in Puerto Rico remains susceptible to natural disaster, frequent prolonged outages and generation issues that makes it unstable and need, need of improvements. Further, when faced with a natural disaster, such as Hurricane Fiona, 
the power sector face extreme pressure to restore service, and unfortunately, the adequate communication procedure still are not in place to make sure communication provides providers can communicate effectively with the power sector. A larger system outage resulted from a cable cut caused during the restoration of a power line. Notwithstanding these challenges, we are committed to serving our customer, particularly when they need the service the most and in terms of other events. We have greatly appreciated the FCC support through the Uniendo and the Connect US Drive funds and believe that we have used that support wisely with 100% sites back up 90% with permanent generator. More than 70% of our fiber of the core is buried, hundreds of underground miles of fiber and other resilient measure. But we still have work to, to do to harden infrastructure and build up our resiliency. We hope to count on your support for that. We also look forward to continue to work with the power sector to improve our combined responsiveness to customer. Thank you. And that concludes my statement for today. Looking forward to our questions and our debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now hear from Arturo Masoldea. Thank you for the, the opportunity and the invitation. I think we all know about the challenges that we're facing in Puerto Rico, political, uh, the climate uh, related to the geology and, and that reality that we have to confront. But it have, it, it's not the Hurricane Maria or Hurricane Fiona, the greatest threat to Puerto Ricans. I think for us in the community, it, it's the aftermath. The power failure is a critical one. Uh, I am from the mountains of Puerto Rico. I'm a biologist and I'm di directing Casa Pueblo. We have been managing state forests. We are promoting uh, educational services to the community. And we have been advocating to this decentralize power generation and to promote energy generation at the point of consumption by redefining instead of fossil fuels to embrace endogenous resources like solar power as the primary energy uh, source. In Casa Pueblo, we did our first installation in 1999. In 2007, we upgraded. And at that point, we, we acquired a radio station, Radio Casa Pueblo. And in 2017, before Hurricane Maria, we transformed that radio station into a fully community and ecological station. Uh, however, after Hurricane Maria, we had power. We became an energy oasis, a radio station. The studios, they, they were power, fully power, and we were able to provide services. But the lack of communication services and, and problems with the transmission tower forced us to redefine uh, uh, our project. At that point, FEMA told us about installing a second generator instead of one, changing from a 50-gallon uh, diesel tank to a 200-gallon uh, diesel tank. And instead, we decided to change the transmitter to one of more uh, energy efficient. And we installed 42 solar panels and energy storage for the transmission tower. What happened after with Hurricane Maria, uh, Hur Hurricane Fiona, I'm sorry, is that we were able to operate normally before, during, and after Hurricane F Fiona without the need for any backup generator at mm -hmm. all. Despite all the cloudy days that follow that storm and still the rain events were producing more energy at the point of consumption. Uh, Satellite internet also proved to be quite important at that time. So what we're promoting and what we think should be done is that generating clean energy with rooftop solar at the point of consumption represents a climate adaptation pathway that reduces the emissions from the associated to the communication industry on good days and also offers energy resilience for continued operations and services at times of crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now hear from Angela Maria Nardalillo. Hello, my name is Angela Maria Nardalillo. A little disclaimer, I live in Puerto Rico. My mother's Puerto Rican. Um, I just flew back from Puerto Rico. So this is off script. Just gonna um, explain what we've been doing. And I'm the founder of Off the Grid Missions. We're 
an NGO, the only NGO in the world that's dedicated to providing life-saving resources to deaf and hard of hearing people in disaster stricken regions in remote areas around the world. We focus on natural disasters. We focus on war. Uh, we've been working since 2017 in Puerto Rico, responding to Hurricane Maria but Off the Grid itself was founded in 2009. So we've been working natural disasters, civil war, the Russian invasion. We've been working throughout the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, Haiti, Bahamas, the southernmost part of the United States. We've been working in Ukraine, Indonesia, and so forth. The reason I'm here today is because I would like to speak about the problems as it relates to the deaf and hard of hearing community, uh, as well as the disabled, um, community too, because when communications are down, when the power grid is down, communications are cut off for deaf and hard of hearing people. When you have people who rely on visual communication, when you have people who rely on different forms of communication, for example, sign language is not accessible to all deaf people. Uh, written uh, communication Communication is not accessible to all deaf people. So myself, for example, I use my voice to communicate. Other deaf people may use sign language. Uh, people who use sign language don't use captions. So providing access in all forms is so important. On television, when there's a disaster, the interpreter standing with, I notice it happens in Puerto Rico. I don't see it in the United States. When the news releases information about the disaster, the interpreter stands together with the speaker and it's on the screen. In the United States, they don't have that. If they have the interpreter, it's for the people that are in person, but that's not where the information is most uh, needed. We focus on marginalized communities because they're the last ones to get the resources when Communications are cut off, like Edwin had said in the last panel, it was very important how, how important communications are when it comes to disasters. When there's a disaster, deaf people are the first ones to be cut off, and that means they're the last ones to get the help. Most information is passed around by loudspeaker. For example, the NGOs, they come in, they provide the water, the food, the shelter. Most of that information is by loudspeaker, walkie talkies and it's word of mouth. So it gets passed and it gets lost when it comes to deaf people. So our organization focuses on first, looking for deaf and hard of hearing people. Second, providing sustainable supplies. We, we provide a lot of solar light with Luminade and that solar light has solar charging systems for the phones so that they can send and receive information so that they could communicate when the lights are off. Because at night when the lights are off, it's hard to com communicate in sign language. You can't get the other person's attention. So I've noticed in Puerto Rico, including in my house, the lights go off a lot. Because I work internationally, it's hard to continue the work in other places where our organization works, like in the US, like in Florida, like overseas in Europe. So when we talk about shutting off the lights to save lives, disabled people who rely on maybe breathing machines and so forth, we're not thinking about deaf people because it's a life and death situation when the communications get cut off. And so I'm here today to talk from the position of a front lines individual, a first responder, and to talk for the deaf and hard of hearing community who we can't, we can't be, uh, it's hard to recognize a deaf person. And when there's help, there's a big gap between the help and it reaching deaf and hard of hearing people. So I want to thank you for this opportunity. And I hope that I'm here to provide as much insight as possible. And thank you. Thank you very much. And for our final witness uh, on our second panel, we will hear from Matthew Tuck.
Hey, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to reiterate Mr. Uh, Aronson's comments. The prior panel provided some fantastic feedback. I especially agree with Mr. Fila's statement in regards to coordination between power and telecommunication providers. That's immensely important. Uh, again, my name is Matthew Tuck. I'm part of the Verizon Global Network Operations team, and my responsibilities include satellite solutions for wireless, Verizon's drone program, and business continuity planning for the wireless and business network segments. Uh, immediately before, during, and after Hurricane Ian, I was involved in coordinating the pre-storm staging of mobile assets, out-of-market team resources, leading the deployment of mobile assets after the storm passed, and the recovery and return of those mobile assets as the network restoration was completed. We greatly appreciate the chairwoman's invitation and the commission's feedback. Uh, in addition to traditional mobile response solutions like mobile cell sites, portable generators, small satellite-based solutions, and some of the new more rugged deployable assets like Business Incorporated Satellite Onboard Nomadic or the Bison, and the Tactical Humanitarian Operations Response Vehicle or THOR that was used on Fort Myers Beach, Hurricane Ian's response contains several noteworthy newer assets, and we want to focus our dialogue here on those assets. Uh, first and foremost, we want to talk about drones. Recent hurricane events have put a spotlight on new drone-based solutions. Verizon has been broadly using drones for tower inspections for over three years now, with thousands of flights under our belt. The use of small drones for tower inspection and the ability to see sites with restricted or limited access enables much faster repair and response. We also use larger tethered drones to create flying cell sites to temporarily provide service to Sanibel Island after Ian. This high altitude wireless kilowatt or Hawk solution was first deployed during Hurricane Laura in Louisiana in 2020 and was initially tested in the year prior for safety and feasibility. Solutions such as the Hawk provide a powerful response in the initial days following a storm before more permanent terrestrial assets can be deployed to restore service. The ability to fly an aircraft and provide cellular service is also a powerful solution for search and rescue in mountainous terrain, providing service in flooded areas. Rapidly restoring temporary service following a tornado, such as in Mayfield, Kentucky earlier this year, or in island isolation scenarios with limited access is what we saw in Hurricane Ian. But using drones this way requires substantial effort and investment. Under current FAA rules, there must be eyes on the drone 24 by 7, which necessitates a team of folks staying with the asset during deployments. Longer term, we expect to use multiple Hawk units to create mesh networks of temporary coverage quickly following a major event to ensure critical communications are available when people need them most. Secondly, we want to hit on satellite. Verizon has been testing advanced satellite technologies such as Mid-Earth Orbit or MEO and Low Earth Orbit or LEO for several years and has deployed satellite solutions to temporarily replace fiber backhaul to connect cell sites to the core network following network impacting disaster events. Deploying a MEO backhauled small cell solution immediately improved communications on Fort Myers Beach for public safety and first responders. We found the solution has much lower latency than geostationary satellite solutions and greater throughput potential. Directional solutions using NEO and LEO satellite constellations will become more common following major events to meet these needs. Verizon deploys its satellite solutions over dedicated length bandwidth, which is extremely important when considering that shared bandwidth can and will result in congestion issues as usage of such solutions grows within the consumer and public safety space. This is just a limited snapshot of our massive investment in the mobile asset solutions we use to support critical communications for consumers and first responders. Thank you for your time today and the opportunity to participate in the discussion and I look forward to your questions. Thank you to the witnesses on our second panel and now we'll proceed to some questions. We'll start with you, Commissioner Carr. Uh, thanks so much again to this panel. It's been very helpful and uh, you know one of the points that's been made up is infrastructure, how we can continue to uh, build out, streamline both before and after. Um, and I know as a, as a legal matter at the FCC, we've tried to sort of reject this idea that there's a difference between coverage on the one hand and capacity sites on another as a legal matter uh, and a lot of these siting issues. But also as a practical matter, I think these disasters uh, show that um, in an emergency, uh, 
capacity is coverage. Uh, we rely on so many of these cell sites now. But I want to sort of go back to a topic that I think we're going to continue to focus on, which is greater coordination on the power and, and, and telecom side. And so let me go to uh, Scott Aronson, who uh, is more than a Blake screen, I understand. He, he, is, uh, he is suited up behind there. Um, you know, obviously, you know, from your perspective at Edison Electric, there may be a different perspective than some of the telcos, and, and that's reasonable. But what do you think more can be done to sort of, putting aside how well you think the coordination is going <laughs> at the moment, who's to blame uh, for the lack of it, what more do you think can be done to sort of further improve telco, electric utility coordination in the, in the immediate hours and days after a storm? Yeah, a couple of things, and I, I appreciate uh, recognizing that I'm, I'm more than a blank screen. Um, so uh, I would say, look, a couple of things that have been hit throughout the conversation today. Uh, emergency operations centers represent a really important uh, center of gravity during the response to events. And so, you know, I, I like to quote uh, both uh, Mike Tyson and uh, President Eisenhower, and that's always a lot of fun, right? Uh, plans are useless, but planning is everything. And everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And I, I think this notion of developing relationships in blue skies uh, and uh, understanding each other's equities uh, before an event happens is, is, in, is critical. But then when that incident happens and there is devastation and destruction everywhere, you also have to recognize that decisions need to be made in real time. And the best way to make those decisions in real time is to give authority to the most local level possible. And that's where emergency operations centers come in. So I think the um, improvements that we have seen in recent years are, on the one hand, because we are going through that activity of planning so effectively and collaboratively between these two critical sectors. And then when the incident happens and the rubber is meeting the road uh, at those emergency operation centers, we're able to kind of deconflict and uh, address challenges in real time, both because those relationships exist and because there is a common situational awareness that can only be provided at that EOC level. Thanks. Uh, one other question for me, we uh, talked, I believe Matthew is you, about the different types of technologies that you bring to bear in the immediate aftermath from satellites to drones, uh, cows, colts as well. Is there more that we can do to help support that diversity of technologies or do you think it's sort of progressing naturally on its own in terms of being delivered uh, into these disaster areas? So thank you. I think that's a great question. I, I think the opportunity here is actually coordination between the FCC and the FAA as it relates to things like tethered assets and how we treat them. Uh, so the ability to deploy those rapidly, uh, we actually experienced excellent coordination between the local EOC and the FAA in getting permission to fly that tethered aircraft. I think how we treat those systems they're effectively cell towers. They just happen to be powered by a motor and a fiber and a tether up the line. Uh, so how we treat those, I think is probably the greatest opportunity and the ability to remote monitor, uh, deploy, understand how those are behaving and then remotely land that aircraft if it's an issue, I think is the greatest opportunity. So I think the regulations there present a couple of challenges. Uh, they're there for good reason and for safety. So we need to prove effectively that those aircraft are in fact safe with a, which our understanding at this point they appear to be uh, but i think that's the greatest opportunity is fcc faa coordination as it relates to those particular aircraft and then further advanced solutions when we go to more connected aviation vehicles thanks well i'm, I'm surprised here there could be better fcc faa coordination we rarely uh, see that pop up over here but we'll we'll take a look at that but but thank you for that i appreciate it all yes, right, sir. Commissioner Starks. Yes, thank you. Uh, I want to direct this question to uh, Ms. Angela Maria Nardalillo. Um, thank you for your powerful uh, work and testimony um, here this morning. I, I, I deeply appreciate it. Um, and, and I, you know, in your opening, you kind of talked about the, the global scale, uh, but you also kind of hinted at a couple things that you would like to see uh, better addressed here in the United States. And so, you know, can you give us a couple more uh, ideas or solutions that you'd like to see from um, uh, making sure that, that some of these uh, deaf and hard of hearing individuals um, 
receive the best um, uh, outreach, um, uh, you know, preparedness, which we've been talking about, and, and then, of course, kind of execution. Sure, thank you. So, as you know, when the disaster strike and the electricity gets turned off, deaf people are the last ones to get the information. Uh, the information that's passed around is not specific for people who have disabilities, uh, for individuals who rely on visual communications. So when talking about, for example, the news, I notice a lot that the interpreter is standing next to the speaker, if there's an interpreter there, but the interpreter is not on the screen. And that's so important because most people who are cut off from the information are not in the audience, in the physical audience. They're watching the, the screen. So it's very important to have the interpreter on screen, news, and not just limited to news, to entertainment, all the way through with television, to have the interpreter on the screen. Why not just limit to captions? Because many deaf people, the first language is sign language. English is the second language. Reading and writing would be the second language, the second language. So to have the interpreter on the screen, it's a completely different language. Sign language, it doesn't have the same grammatical structure, uh, the nuance, everything is very, very different. It, there's deaf culture involved. That interpreters are certified with that information to provide access. So that's a, a very important place to start. I'll give you an example. In the airport, you have TSA. You have deaf on your ticket, and the, the, the attendant, they will come up and they don't have any kind of knowledge of how to interact with the deaf person. Instead, they provide the wheelchair. So there's just this big gap of information of ways to help provide access and it's not just in a disaster so if you can imagine that's how it is in an airport when there's a change of flight there's no lights to alert people that there's a different gate change can you imagine what it's like during a disaster when information is so rapidly changing so by the time the deaf person does get the information it's already changed so that's a big way to improve is having the interpreters on screen all the time, having caption, live caption, all the way through, transcripts all the way through. On social media, they're starting to have more live caption, which is great. Having transcripts inside all the commentary is very important as well. Um, I've also noticed when it comes to response, Puerto Rico in the United States, when FEMA's there to interview, to have individuals fill out the information, there always needs to be support because many deaf people are cut off from being approved with FEMA because they don't read or write. So they don't fill out the application properly, so they lose out mm. on the resources. And those resources come much later than the food and the water access right there. So I believe that if there was some kind of of way to collect that information before the disaster strikes. Where do deaf people live? What are their names? Do they have CODAs? A CODA is a child whose parents are deaf. The CODAs also cut off when a deaf person is cut off. When a parent is cut off, that means their children are cut off, whether they hear or they don't. So I notice we talk about communications a lot and everything is very limited to right here, right here, that's it. The way that people communicate is not the same and that's something that needs to be worked on and we haven't even begun to scratch the surface. So I'm here. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for uh, your ideas. Thank you for your impact. Uh, very briefly, um, I'd like to hear uh, to Mr. Najee Khoury uh, I, I know uh, my colleagues also have questions and, and time's growing on here. Uh, can you quickly tell me how Liberty is doing in supporting FirstNet? Yeah, Commissioner, thank you for the question. Uh, we are the authorized uh, provider of FirstNet uh, 
in, in Puerto Rico. We have been uh, for the past uh, almost two years, a bit more than two years. Uh, this was our, our uh, I would say, our second test. Uh, I think we passed it with flying color. We did well. The network held. Uh, we activated emergency. We worked really closely with the first responders. So we're doing good. We're building a few more sites that are left in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. We're not there yet, uh, struggling a bit with some uh, permits, uh, but we're getting there. Uh, but I would say we're, we're on, in a very good shape. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Symington. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I would, I guess, uh, like to direct um, this question is initially to, uh, to Mr. Tuck in particular. So um, I'm, uh, uh, thanks very much for talking to us about uh, some of the new technologies that are deployed as well as some of the regulatory changes that are that are possible and you know obviously as as we find ways to simplify regulation and increase uptake then um, these new technologies will become more affordable and will be more widely deployed and thus you know become a, a more normal part of disaster response so that's great to hear about um, <coughs> I'm intrigued in this context by direct satellite to cell phone communi communications such as uh, one carrier's collaboration with Starlink or one OEM's with Global Star. Um, how do you see these solutions, I'm sorry, in fitting in with some of what you're working on, um, including integration with drone or plane stations, and what do you think the cost impact of this is, is likely to be um, in the long term? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Simonson. Um, as I currently understand that technology, and, and we're still learning about it as it gets developed, um, I see the initial realm of that direct satellite to user endpoint really for voice communications and possibly text. I, I believe throughput um, may eventually be a real challenge there, but that ability to call and connect when you absolutely need it is critical. So I, I do see it as uh, probably a likely directional thing, not only for uh, users on the ground, but in aviation as well. Uh, so I believe it works in concurrence. So when you're dealing with the, the properties of satellite and larger dish and more power equals greater throughput potential, obviously you can only cram so much of an antenna into those uh, cell phones that we carry around, uh, which is why I, I'm speculative a little bit about the potential throughput of them, but excited about the opportunity of folks being, being able to connect when they need to the most. Uh, so I believe that's sort of where I, I put that initially. I think there's a lot of understanding and development to come um, it's a very exciting area. It is also going to have tremendous impact in other areas. So uh, really looking forward to seeing where that low Earth orbit technology leads us because it really does offer the potential uh, for lower latency and greater throughput. So uh, a very exciting area for sure. Uh, thank you very much. And I guess yes, I'd, um, I'd, I guess I'd like to um, address this next question, uh, or I guess this, this a or to ask for a reaction as much as anything from uh, Ms. Nardolio uh, on on this point, because uh, there's a, there's a tension I think between reducing the cost of infrastructure, which of course we want to do, and we want to have infrastructure that can be deployed more rapidly. There's a tension between that and the human factor in response, which uh, Ms. Nardolio has talked about. So, um, so you know, for example, while I was preparing my question list, it occurred to me that uh, new technologies are likely to um, to reduce some infrastructure costs. While, uh, on the other hand, not being able to furnish additional workers to a PSAP or uh, or additional uh, uh, cultural and linguistic competence to first responders. So, I guess my question would be. Um, uh, just apart from resourcing, should we be developing some sort of parallel system? Or on the other hand, w w how would we best integrate new technologies in such a way that we make sure that they are uh, valuable to, you know, for example, the deaf and hard of hearing community or other communities that are likely to, um, to encounter those technologies um, in ways that maybe are not tailored for them? Sure, good question. So there's, there's a big gap between the NGOs uh, and the sector so that I feel we're starting now with that process of possibly making a change. Um, and so I want to thank you for this opportunity with that, especially. Um, 
I do feel there needs to be parallel work. When I say parallel, I mean NGOs collaborating with the FEMAs, with the communication companies. In many marginalized communities, even if they have uh, television, TV, maybe it's one person in the house and they're cut off from that. So we definitely need to think bigger than we're doing right now. As I mentioned before, gathering that information prior to a disaster is so crucial. We work on a very grassroots level, person to person within the deaf community. So when a disaster hits, it is a disaster within a disaster for my organization because we are educating NGOs on the ground about deaf and hard of hearing people. We are educating about making everything as visual as possible. So my background before I was a founder of Off the Grid is creative director for television, for games, uh, for film. And so I've worked very heavily with access and I've worked very heavily with technology. Right now in parallel with Off the Grid's ground response, I develop online emergency hubs. What I do is I gather information from other NGOs. Where's the food being provided? Where are the shelters? Who's providing what? And I put it all on a web page and it's provided accessible for deaf, hard of hearing people, but not limited to deaf and hard of hearing people. Anyone can access that information because right now there's not a hub of those resources and those resources that NGOs are doing on the ground, we work hand in hand with Waste for Water, Clean Water Corps, with Airlink. Those NGOs that are working on the ground, first responders, they have a lot of resources that, that need to be bridged together. And that can go a long way with communication. So when a disaster strikes, yes, we're preparing for the response on the ground to provide the illuminate solar lights to provide the clean water filtration systems. But behind the scenes, we're working on educating NGOs about how to just communicate with deaf people, how to provide the resources to know where deaf people are. There's half a billion people who are deaf, hard of hearing in the world. So it's not a small number. And so providing and building that bridge of the NGOs that are doing the groundwork. And when I say doing the groundwork, I don't mean going and dropping off the supplies. We are navigating, we are risking our lives every day, looking for deaf people who are cut off from information. We are together going in all over the world in very dangerous regions, and we don't have the support we need. Most of our teams, NGOs, when I say our, I don't mean just off the grid, but many NGOs out there, they're volunteering their time, they're not getting paid, or they're underpaid for the work they do. While you have the other positions who are getting paid, and they're not bridging together the resources. And so I think bridging together that big gap will be the beginning of how we can move forward to bridging together the resources that are on the ground, the water, the food, those who are providing it right away. FEMA filling out applications, that resource is gonna come much later. But people need right away, they need the food, they need the water, and our NGOs have those resources. So by bridging it with the communication entities, I mean, we could do a lot together. Uh, so that's, that's many ways that we are handling it, and I think that now could be the beginning of how we could kind of bridge that together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Symington. All right, um, I've got some quick final questions. Uh, Mr. Masaldea, uh, you talked a lot about the importance of energy generation at the point of consumption. And I'm curious how fast you think that kind of solution could scale in Puerto Rico, maybe in Puerto Rican rural communities, and what that would mean for continuous communication service? I think uh, it's a very doable approach. It can be done, the technology is out there, it, it works. 
Uh, in our case, the design and the installation took like uh, less than a month uh, for, for us to have our transmission tower energized. Uh, I think it, it has to be the way to go. Uh, we, we have to reduce the communication services footprint on the planet. We have to build energy resilience. Um, and it's not going to be done through the transmission and distribution lines. I think that centralized system is going to keep failing to Puerto Rico for different reasons. So it's, it's very urgent that we establish a policy in which uh, we can yield as much power as we can at the point of consumption and reduce the vulnerability from uh, from the centralized system. It could be a hybrid, but but the solar to be the primary energy source in a hybrid configuration with the public utility, and then power generators as a backup. Uh, we were about to turn our power generator on at some point. But if needed, it was going to be just for a few hours. Um, so we reduce all the cost and the vulnerability to get access to these transmission towers, which are in remote, remote areas, um, which is the main cause of, of failing uh, the communication setup. I mean, towers in, in remote areas, landslides everywhere because of the rain, the weather, the road, the, the poor infrastructure and maintenance. So I think it can be done. Uh, it, it's political will. I think the resources have been allocated to Puerto Rico. Why not invest in that for energy resilience for, for, for the uh, communication infrastructure? Well, thank you. And last question to you, Mr. Curry. Uh, it, you know, I'm sure that there's a lot of questioning about how Puerto Rico communications fared comparing Hurricane Maria, Hurricane Fiona, and my own visits have uh, left me with the impression that a lot of improvements have been made in the intervening five years. But I'm wondering specifically with respect to the coordination between the power authorities and communications providers. What has changed? Um, are there things that have gotten better or are there things that have gotten worse? Madam Chair, thank you for the questions. Uh, I think you, you, uh, you hit... Uh, a very sensitive point. Uh, first, you're absolutely right. Uh, our, the performance of the industry uh, has been uh, quite significant compared to Hurricane Maria. Uh, so hopefully we will never experience that ever again. Uh, so very proud of all the work we've done and all the help that you all have helped us through. We can do more, but uh, I think we're getting there. In terms of the uh, communication with the power company, uh, allow me to be very transparent uh, in, in, in this answer. Um, the gentleman that was in the previous um, uh, panel made the point that I have been trying to fight for almost more than six years and I have failed in every single occasion, which is having a seat in the emergency operating center in the power authority to coordinate the restoration in the process. I have failed and that hasn't worked. I have attempted and I have failed in every single time. So that's something that could be very helpful in the process. Second, there is unfortunately in the island a tremendous amount of finger pointing in the process of the restoration within the generation versus the distribution. For those of you who are in the, you know, in the power industry, two different uh, aspects, two different challenges, but we could never get a straight answer for the distribution issue or a generation issue. One drives uh, repair, one just, just waiting for the generation to occur so uh, power can, you know, can be restored. So that coordination was improved uh, during Fiona, but definitely not to the level that it should be, and definitely not with the technology that we have today. The power grid in Puerto Rico is extremely fragile. It's causing massive costs to, to all of us, costs that we could have been invested in making it more resilient burying more fiber, maintaining towers that are very far away, and as uh, you know, uh, Arturo said very well, finding uh, you know, other ways of, of supplying those towers, could it be solar batteries, whatever it is. But unfortunately, uh, I don't think we, we have an A. I think that's, you know, if I have to grade that relationship, it's probably closer to a C than an A at this stage. 
Thank you, Mr. Curry. I, I just want to thank all of our panelists for their incredible candor, uh, your knowledge, and also your willingness to share your experiences. It really deepens our knowledge about these matters at the FCC. And that's really important because we, um, we want to continue to work on these issues. And I have no doubt that every, uh, my colleagues over here are coming away with new insights uh, as a result of what we've heard from all of you today. Uh, among other things, of course, today's hearing has highlighted the need to improve coordination between communications and power sectors. And really, coordination is so essential before, during, and after the disasters. So uh, we're going to continue to look at these issues. Our goal, of course, is simple. We just want to be better prepared for when the next disaster comes. So I want to express a special thanks to my FCC team for pulling this together on short notice particularly those in the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, the Office of Media Relations, and the Commission Meeting Room staff. Without uh, all of these folks working, none of this would have been possible. Again, thank you to the panelists. Thank you to my colleagues today. And I promised I'd get you out of here by 1.30, and I'm doing it with two, mu two minutes to spare. Thank you all. Appreciate it. This hearing's done.